My mother's biggest fear was that I would turn out gay. Her second biggest fear was that I'd write a book about it, and her third biggest fear was that I would write about her. <laughs> Which is exactly what I ended up doing. Mother dear has lived a life plagued by misery. No twist of fate nor thrust of dame chance has ever been seen by her as having any positive value. Oh no, just one more menacing inconvenience to bear. Naturally, she wanted for her children what she had failed to find. In short, happiness. I was bright enough to realize that I was out of step with the world around me, but I didn't care. That's just the way I was. I hated sports. I liked playing with my little sister's dolls. I hated fighting. I liked a good, clean discussion. <laughs> And I hated being disappointed by real people, and so spent the majority of my time in my imagination. Needless to say, Mother Dear grew increasingly concerned. My very first visit to the psychiatrist was based on just this account. I was six years old and hadn't a clue why I was being called off to such a doctor. Feeling physically fine, I inquired as to what it was I might be sick with. It's a different kind of sickness, I was told. It has to do with paying attention in school. <laughs> True. Forest Park Elementary bored me beyond belief, but I had maintained an above average score. The need for medical help in this area remained a point of confusion. Never mind, I was assured as we lurched off in my mother's over air conditioned car. You ought to be making straight A's. I know I did. <laughs> the doctor was a thin man of middle age. He wore a dark suit and had lots of books on display. He asked me to close my eyes and feel a series of objects telling him what they were. Coins, pencils, a letter opener, and no time at all the visit was complete. <laughs> that night, the episode found its way into my sexual fantasies. <laughs> I dreamt of a young, handsome doctor who asked me to close my eyes and feel his coins, <laughs> his pencils, <laughs> his... <laughs> On the way home, I inquired more insistently, what was that all about? I'm just looking after your happiness, dear, but I'm happy. No, you're not. <laughs> Just think you are. <laughs> well, then what is happiness? Obviously, my mother knew, but she wasn't going to tell. <laughs> the following Thanksgiving, I witnessed a scene at a family dinner concerning my Aunt Susie Knox that began to give me a few clues. Susie was my favorite relative. When visiting her, you could do whatever you liked and eat what you wanted. All rules were suspended for the madness of the moment, madness being one of Susie's strongest suits. <laughs> Susie married into our family. She was never liked by the adults, and because she wasn't really one of us, open venom directed towards her was excusable. <laughs> she and Uncle Patrick rarely participated in family events due to this tension, and when they did, she invariably drank too much. Susie was 45 weighed 90 pounds, and had no eyebrows. <laughs> she had plucked them all out in high school, and they had never grown back, so each morning she drew them on to suit her mood. <laughs> <laughs> that day, they were thick, black, angular bars. <laughs> she was anticipating the presence of my great aunt Tula. <laughs> Tula Skull <laughs> was, is, and will always be an enormous woman. <laughs> Thanks to the timely deaths and disabilities of her three sisters, she is the ruling matriarch of the family. She does whatever she likes, has rarely been crossed, and answers to no one. Tula's full of outrageous opinions and plenty of contradictions. I remember seeing her at dawn, thundering out of her bedroom, stuffed 
into an old pair of Levi's, carrying an armload of fishing gear and cursing her awkwardness. A few hours later, she was immaculately dressed, seated at the head of the dining table and carving a large catfish with a big shiny knife. <laughs> Susie didn't come from a family that held the tradition of an undisputed ruler. She thought Tula overbearing, pompous, <coughs> and a bore. <laughs> Tula, in turn, was worse than anybody about Susie. She had no patience, compassion, nor sense of humor regarding carefree alcoholics. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick had been the one to insist on having everyone at the same table for dinner. He still hoped that someday his beloved bride would gain acceptance. Cocktails were abundant. There was little talk of pilgrims and none of God. <laughs> there was a lot of talk about how long a turkey ought to cook for and whether there were enough oysters in the oyster casserole. Tula said that she was sure hostess was in no shape to manage culinary duties and that she wouldn't be surprised in the least if the whole thing came out underdone. <laughs> Why this was even a concern was beyond me. Aunt Susie's dinner, like all my aunt's affairs, would be cooked and served by a black maid. <laughs> After another slightly disguised series of condescensions, Susie, not, much, not sure of how much longer she could hold her tongue, exited to the kitchen. She mounted a stool and engaged in several large martinis, <laughs> solitaire. <laughs> the table was a lush setting for 16. Patrick with Tula at the head and Susie at the tail. By this time, Susie was very drunk. She didn't touch her food. While the rest of us gabbed and ate our way through the enormous feast, Susie just watched us. <laughs> with a curious contempt, sipping her wine. <laughs> As Tula reached for the second turkey leg, Susie finally spoke. Tula Skull! <laughs> you are the fattest damn woman I have ever laid eyes on in my life! <laughs> Susie stood up turned on her heels and staggered off in the direction of the living room. There was a loud crash. Patrick rose with the impulse to see what had happened. Tula stopped him with the slight motion of her hand. A self-satisfied smile on her lips. She nodded and again lifted her fork. Dinner would continue in peace. <laughs> Susie would remain wherever she might have landed. <laughs> I couldn't wait to finish so I could go check on her. When I did, I found her face down in an African violet, <laughs> sprawled halfway on, halfway off the coffee table. <laughs> She'd been crying. She looked at me and began to finger her pearls. I wanted to say that to that bitch <laughs> for 23 years. <laughs> As I was helping her up the stairs, I told her I was sorry. Sorry? Don't be sorry for me. Regardless of what you might think, I am a very happy woman. It's them you ought to feel sorry for. They haven't got a clue. <laughs> she went into her bedroom and closed the door. I stood in the hallway, speechless. Some instinct inside of me knew what Aunt Susie had said was true. All doubt was erased from my mind. The next day, in excited confidence, I went up to my mother and I told her, I finally figured out what happiness is. What? Aunt Susie, I announced. <laughs> the following week, I was again taken to see that psychiatrist. <laughs> Only this time, my confusion had turned into something a little more concrete. As I sat there, answering the doctor's questions, I began to resent Mother Dear tremendously. I knew that happiness lay far beyond her obsessive concerns. And I intended to find out where 